podium, Dr. Alan Weiss. Well, good evening and thank you for coming out. Actually, good evening. <laughs> that, that was almost anemic, you know, you heard. I, I used to work in the drug abuse business and there, you know, everybody holds hands, sings Kumbaya and you go, good evening, you know, they go, ah, good evening. So I've become addicted to it. So <laughs> thank you very much. Well, I'm, I'm very pleased to be here and, and as I was putting this talk together, uh, I hope you'll find it interesting. It's sort of a, a scientist's perspective about the nature of the relationship between science and the rest of society today and sort of how we've gotten here. So I apologize in advance. I come from the Northeast. I speak very fast and I will have way too many slides. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm only making one or two points. Okay. This is just to give you an idea. So the overall climate for science in this country around the world is determined by, you can read as well as I, scientific progress. Funding is always a big issue, jobs and careers. There is an increasing phenomenon of globalization of science. And then of course, what's most important is the broader societal context and I'll spend most of the time on that. I have to tell you a story about this slide. So when I worked at the National Institutes of Health, I gave out a billion dollars a year. Coincidental to that, I have a terrible liberal arts education in spite of having gone to a liberal arts college and taught for over a decade in a liberal arts university. Um, and I, I actually used to use the phrase as Shakespeare used to say, but, you know, when you give out a lot of money, you're the smartest person in the room. <laughs> Literally, nobody ever corrected me. As soon as I got to AAAS, right, put up the Shakespeare slide, you can imagine. Um, so, it's true. So, on the one hand, we are, in fact, living in the best of scientific times. Advances in science are coming at a tremendous rate. Both normal advances, what we call incremental advances in science, and then the sort of quantal jumps in what's going on when we have sort of transformative events. I actually believe that many of those, perhaps most of them, come about because of advances in technology, where technology enables scientists to ask questions they never were able to think about before. And then, of course, we're, we're in an era where more and more pressure is being exerted within the scientific community for uh, increased funding for what you might think of as transformative research. So there's incremental and then there's the sort of quantum stuff, uh, quantum change stuff. And it's been very difficult historically to get sort of high risk, high payoff research funded but more and more through uh, pressure on government agencies, they're setting aside money for that. I wanted to give you an example of where technology has in fact been able to uh, transform our understanding of a fundamental concept, so I can't control myself. So most of you have heard of that famous ad. <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story about that too. So the partnership for, the drug, for a drug-free America who came up with this ad, um, the head of it was a guy named Jim Burke. I was the chairman of J&J, &J, a wonderful, wonderful uh, person. And I went to see him and I said, you know, this is scientifically terrible. Drugs don't actually fry your brain and you know, awful, horrible, don't use this ad. And he smiled and he said, coincidentally, yesterday we got the top award of the advertising industry <laughs> for that thing. And they never used it. But, but it is a bad metaphor, actually. It's not accurate. But that is your brain on drugs. So the ability to look into the brain of a living, breathing, awake, behaving individual and watch what happens when they have a drug experience is really very dramatic. So on the top, what you see, um, you don't need the detail of it, but 
but this is a functional MRI scan, and, and what you see here is uh, activation on top during the early part of a drug experience. These are addicted individuals. We don't give cocaine to non-addicted individuals. You will be relieved to know or perhaps disappointed. Um, so, so you see during the early stage, there's this sort of initial euphoria, and then as the drug starts to wear off, they experience craving. You can actually watch changes. And by now, we know in excruciating detail the brain mechanisms that underlie these kinds of experiences. But my point is that we, we actually wouldn't have known this unless we had these technologies that enabled us to ask these kinds of questions. And of course, they have tremendous implications in this particular case. First of all, it helps us understand that addiction is not just a criminal justice issue, it's also a health issue, and in fact, addiction is a brain disease. What happens is prolonged drug use changes the brain in fundamental and long-lasting ways that last long after the individual stops taking drugs and have all, has all those behavioral consequences we all know about. It affects treatment approaches, and obviously, if it's a health issue, you can't solve the problem with only a criminal justice approach. I'm not suggesting that you could solve it with only a public health approach either. So it, it requires a strategy as complex as the illness. My point for our purpose is that science has in fact revolutionized our fundamental understanding about addiction and what to do about it. Okay, so more generally, in my adult lifetime, remember I said the evolving context, so it's evolving over at least my lifetime. Science and technology have never been more important than they are now. And I won't go through this whole list, but I would challenge any of you to come up with an issue of modern life that does not have a science and technology component, either as a cause or a cure. It's embedded in absolutely everything, and the consequence of that is that it, in order for all people to prosper in the modern world, they have to have a fundamental understanding and comfort with science, lest they be stragglers in the modern age. More and more countries have come to realize that they have to invest in science in order to be able to solve their own national problems. I'll come back to that. And then, of course, for science to prosper, the science-society relationship has to be strong. Okay, I want you to admire that. <laughs> I, when I was in the government, I had people who made my slides. I now work for a nonprofit, I make my slides. And it's a lot of work. So, thank you. Okay. There are a lot of forces converging at the moment that are making the overall climate somewhat rocky. And some of them come from inside of science. And again, I won't go through all of these, but these are examples of issues ongoing within the scientific enterprise that need to be addressed because what they do, if you pick any of them, is that they undermine the overall relationship between science and the rest of society. So we at Science Magazine published the fraudulent South Korean uh, embryonic stem cell paper. Now, that's one paper out of thousands that we publish over a decade. However, one example of scientific misconduct tarnishes all of science, conflict of interest, the National Institutes of Health has 5,000 scientists. Five of them had unreported conflicts of interest that got out into the press. NIH lost millions of dollars in budget because of the tarnish to the enterprise. And, and you can read the rest of them. The, I added these last two just because they seem to be uh, more and more prominent. That is, there's more and more instances where uh, journals are publishing 
mistakes that have to be corrected and instances where uh, in some fields it's been difficult to replicate some findings. Again, these are rare events. They're exceptional events, but they get reported widely and they affect the overall relationship. My own view is that we in the scientific community have an obligation to do a better job, frankly, at getting our own house in order. Anyway, these are internal pressures. There are also, of course, an array of external pressures. Some are good, some are not so good. None of them can be ignored. Probably the most important trend going on, and one that gets discussed very frequently in Washington, where I live, is the fact that uh, science is becoming more and more a global enterprise. And my own view is that the United States has been losing its long-standing preeminence in science. Now, when I say that, I don't believe that the U.S has lost its eminence in most fields, but as more and more countries have invested in science and built the, their own scientific enterprises, they have developed high quality enterprises that therefore challenge American preeminence. So countries invest in science, rich and poor, I, for a while, was uh, collecting countries where I had been in the presence of either a science minister or a, or a head of state, where they said, um, you know, science is good for innovation, innovation is good for the economy, we're going to take over the world, or we're going to, you know, build our economy, and therefore we're going to invest in science. And rich countries, poor countries, east, west, uh, I had collected about 27 countries when I quit counting. Uh, my favorite example is Rwanda, one of the poorest countries in the world, one of the most interesting countries as a phenomenon, and they have decided that because they have no natural resources, they will build the country on their brains and have invested tremendously in education, and science education in particular, and in building a scientific community, they're far from done with that building process, but it's an example of this increase in globalization. This is just to show rates of research expenditures. Again, you can read graphs. This is over time. You'll notice Asia is increasing investment at a tremendous rate. Most of that is China and India, of course, but other Asian countries, European Union, this cuts off at 2009. You may know that the European Union is in the process of having a bicker about whether the science budget will be 70 billion euros or 80 billion euros. It's a 20% increase from the last budget uh, at the 70 billion euro rate. This is just number of publications. Europe has been out publishing the United States since the mid-1990s. Again, you notice that Asia is ra rapidly rising. Uh, there's redundancy in, in these lines, obviously, but, but it's very interesting to watch. And, and the truth is, it's good. It really is. Good science, this is a quote from Subra Suresh, who was the director of the National Science Foundation at the time. As somebody who runs a global scientific society, I do believe that good science anywhere is good for science everywhere. But many people who are America-centric are very concerned about it because with scientific eminence comes all kinds of other stuff. And I had occasion on uh, Thursday of last week to be in a meeting with uh, a number of uh, members of the House of Representatives and what they wanted to talk about was where do we stand with the rest of the world? And we, we were, I was with a group and we were trying to explain it's by discipline and you know, oh, we may be the best in this and not the best in that. And really what they wanted to hear was what would it take to get back to being the best in everything, which I don't think is a particular laudatory goal, but uh, I'm sorry. Uh, anyway, enough of that. So 
the big external factor for scientists is always money. Prospects are scary. There's always, you like that one? That was very hard. I didn't actually know how to do that at first. Um, but the biggest, scariest one, of course, is the sequester, which is having a tremendous effect on science funding. And again, I don't expect you to memorize this chart. So we in Washington can't speak without acronyms. Um, so these are just government agencies. I wanted to show you in constant dollars, right, these trends that have been going on. And, and you can see, so this was during the doubling of the budget of the National Institutes of Health and then the stimulus. America recognized the importance of science to economic prosperity, but then it began to fall off. And now the president has done for 2014 a very interesting thing, and that is he has ignored the sequester. Now the claim is that they built the budget off 20, do you care about this? This is so Washington-centric. Um, anyway, I'll do it just because I, I put the slide in. Um, so, so the sequester may have been a mistake, right? Everybody knows it may have been sort of an accident that wasn't supposed to actually happen. And it has, will have devastating effects on science because you can see that, that fall off. This is in constant inflation adjusted dollars. There's tremendous fall off. Um, so what the president did was actually sort of ignore that dip and then propose 2014 based on 2012 numbers under the argument that uh, that the budget wasn't finished for 2013, if my meaning is clear. <laughs> we knew the budget, uh, but it's clever. We'll see if it holds. It would, it would actually make a very big difference because this effect, particularly for young scientists who are, have been very discouraged by looking at a declining science budget when everybody else in the world is investing more. Okay, enough of that. I'm not going to do that. Another issue is always, do we have enough scientists coming along? Uh, my own view is that we're actually doing okay with that. What we're not doing so well with is um, giving them opportunities to build their labs early enough. So the average age for a first grant from the National Institutes of Health is now 42. National Science Foundation is a whole lot better, it's 36. In my era, if you went to, to college for four years and graduate school for four years, and let's say you didn't take a postdoc, you could have your first grant when you were 25. Imagine if you have to wait until you're in your late 30s, early 40s, before you can establish a laboratory, an independent laboratory, and begin a career. And it really is a terrible problem. My own view is that we're beginning to stifle creativity with this because we can't, you know, we're not giving people the jump start that they need in order to get their career going. And I think it's very discouraging, particularly to young scientists. This is just a depressing chart um, that shows you uh, the number of NIH investigators, the percentage of investigators by age group. So I began my scientific career, I shouldn't tell you this, 1969 before many of you were born. Um, but look what's happened, right? It's older and older scientists and then the number of young scientists has gone down tremendously. Okay, I'm not gonna do that. So what do we do about it? Well. I believe that they don't need more advice and they don't need the three postdocs we're making them take, for those of you who come out of the scientific community. Um, we have all kinds of mechanisms. What I think we ought to do is just give them grants, and many are talking about it. But everything I've talked about so far is really a set of issues that are parochial to the scientific community. That is, they're either issues that can be solved internally or they're issues of primary concern to the scientific community and less so 
although we would love it if it were more so, but less so to the rest of society. That's another one I like. Okay, I'm going to stop that at some point. I, I, just, I, I like it. I think it's hard after dinner to keep people awake. And so every once in a while I like to throw a little something and just make sure I'm awake too. I, I just arrived in California and so I'm a little jet lagged. Um, okay, it's really the broader relationship that I think is what requires the most attention and that what we in the scientific community need to devote more effort to. This is actually my favorite quote in the world. Public sentiment is everything. With it, nothing can fail. Without it, nothing can succeed. And I think that that really speaks to why scientists need to attend much more to the rest of society. Now, every time I say that, Somebody says, but people really like science and they like scientists. And it's true. This is a chart of relative prestige of various professions, okay? And you'll notice that only firefighters are higher than scientists. I'd like to point out where lawyers are. Um, you know, but, you know, that says firefighters, scientists, doctors, nurses, teachers, you know, farmers. Farmers do better than lawyers. Um, yeah, it's a shame actors make so much and athletes make so much. But that notwithstanding, it's an interesting study. It comes from Science Indicators. It was done again recently, and the data came up exactly the same. And forever... Members of the public believe that the benefits of science outweigh its potential harm. So 70 to 90 percent of the public believes that. That's this red line. Since this study was started in 1979, it's been going on. It is just about to come out again in the 2012 version of Science Indicators, and I've seen that. The problem is people really don't know what it is and they don't know what it's about. So first of all, extrasensory perception, not true. <laughs> I, so I'm technically a psychologist by background. In my era, there were not neuroscientists, so we all were trained in psychology or physiology. I was trained in both, but I'm technically a psychologist. I worked at the National Science Foundation, and when Claiborne Pell controlled the budget of NSF when he was a senator, he required that there be an official contact person for parapsychology. <laughs> Thank you. I have seen Ori Geller bend spoons. I have seen the shill he used when he was uh, uh, reading somebody's mind. Um, that notwithstanding, um, it's not true. The, the number about evolution is a very discouraging number, 47%. It's actually stayed pretty much that number of people don't believe that humans developed from earlier species, and astrology is not scientific. I'm sorry. <laughs> so what causes the tension that I referred to? And, and it results from, I, we spoke about the tarnished image of science, and then there is widespread misunderstanding about an array of issues. I did chair a workshop for the Institute of Medicine on autism, and I can tell you that in spite of the fact that the belief that vaccines cause autism was based on one fraudulent study, right, it took us half a day to get rid of that topic and start talking about the rest of the potential causes of autism. It, it's amazing. Genetically modified foods is another example. Sometimes it's issues of political or economic inconvenience like climate change. But the last two are the, actually the most difficult to deal with. Either one's peer group believes a certain way and therefore people have a tendency to go with their peer group or this last category is one that I think is 
shouldn't be the most interesting since it's one of the most difficult to deal with, but it's really interesting. And that is conflicts, where scientific advances are conflicting with people's core beliefs or their core human values. And I've been collecting issues. So embryonic stem cells. The reason people don't like embryonic stem cell research is not because they don't believe, was that English? Yeah. It's not because they don't believe that embryonic stem cell research will lead to better diagnostics and better treatments. They actually know that it likely will. What they object to is that it may, depending on your beliefs, have to do with when life begins. So some religions believe that life begins at the moment of conception or fertilization. If you believe that way, embryonic stem cell research is bad. Other religions believe it occurs at the moment of birth or that life begins sometime later in gestation and pregnancy. And therefore, you don't have a problem with embryonic stem cell research, which involves destroying an embryo early in embryonic development. So science actually has nothing to say about when life begins. Scientists hate when I say that, but it's actually true. It's not a scientific question. When does life begin? Um, and, and therefore, it's a question of belief. So there's one example. Evolution and intelligent design. Francisco Ayala in the audience is one of the best thinkers about this issue of evolution and how to work with religious communities around it. But you all are aware that, that there has been this creationist movement trying to teach what they call intelligent design, basically creationism, in science classrooms. Cosmology. So I added synthetic biology and neuroscience because they are emerging issues where values will conflict. When people figure out what it means that you can make a little tiny sort of living-ish thing in a petri dish, when they figure out maybe you could make a them or worse, a me, um, they're not going to like that. And I can tell you from my own field, when people think about what it means that you don't have a separate mind and body, that your mind is actually in that hard thing on your shoulders, not floating around. Um, and that, in fact, by the way, I have no problem with you not having a separate mind and body, but I have a little more trouble <laughs> conceptualizing it for myself. But the truth is, neuroscience has taught us that the brain is the generator of the mind. Now, that doesn't mean it doesn't have all these qualities to it. Well, what does that say about something like a soul? Where's your soul? Hmm. Anyway, people <laughs> in neuroscience have thought that I've been a little paranoid about this and being hyperbolic. And then the Discovery Institute, the people who brought us intelligent design, put out a statement condemning mental materialism. That's me. They didn't label it me, but that is the issue, right? So this kind of conflict is very difficult. And what matters is that only scientists are actually stuck with what science says. If I violate scientific principles, if I say something that's non-scientific or anti-scientific, um, it's over for me. Right? I, I'm useless. However, normal people have relatively little immediate consequence. They can deny, distort, whatever. I have a friend who is a PhD physicist from an unnamed country beginning with RUS. Um, <laughs> and, and one night we're eating dinner and he says, what about climate change? And I went, oh, climate change. <laughs> and he said, you know what? It's just not true which triggered the tape. I have a 10-minute speech that, you know, just goes Bleh! And the poor guy sat there through it. And at the end, you know, and it involves, you know, thousands, 10,000 studies, converging evidence, geology, geophysics, this, that, right? And at the end of it, he goes, I just don't believe it. <laughs>
<laughs> so, and you know what? The ceiling didn't fall on him. Nothing terrible happened. So the consequences are not very great. And as my friend Francisco taught us, the purpose of science is to tell us about the nature of the natural world, and I added to that, whether we like the answers or not. So I put that in because only recently have I realized that some people are starting to say, don't ask that question. I don't actually want the answer, because I don't like the answer, right? And therefore, we'll pretend it never happened. So this matters. This tension actually matters. It matters because the only reason we have science is the betterment of humankind, ultimately. And if society isn't so fond of science, isn't a ready receptor for what science is contributing, we all lose. And we're not able to do our job. And of course, support for science is undermined. That last bullet, I actually got from the science minister of Japan, who made the observation that in his uh, professional lifetime, he found that uh, the public more and more is wanting to influence the research agenda. And when he first said it, I thought to myself, that's good. It actually is good. The public pays, the public ought to be able to say, why don't you ask this question? This question is important to me. I paid for it. You ought to be answering it. And I, th I actually think that's right. However, what he meant was they don't want stuff done. And he had never experienced that before. And when I thought about it, neither had I. So I throw that in. So what do we do about it? Well, the normal response is to say we just have to educate the public or increase public communication about science. And of course, we have to do that. The other thing I didn't put in is I will tell you that I'm what's known as the official whiner on behalf of science. So every time somebody violates the integrity of science or science education, I do get up and go, you know. And, but the truth is, it doesn't do anything. <laughs> makes me feel good and the people who pay me think I'm doing my job, but it doesn't actually do it. So a part of it is education, but it isn't all education. And, and I want to throw in a little bit of nuance to this about how to work on this problem. It depends on what you want to get done. So it's true that if you are simply trying to share the excitement or get public support or some granting agencies, for those of you who are active scientists, understand there's now broader impacts requirements. So public education can do that, right? Public education will, in fact, uh, help share the excitement. What it won't do by itself is help solve problems and reach common ground. Ultimately, if we want to resolve the tension we have to find common ground. Now, I'm not suggesting that we look for common ground at the extremes, right? Extreme biblical literalists are not moving towards evolution. But I can also tell you that the evangelical atheists are not moving either. And, of course, you know, science really doesn't have much to say about God or not. It has something to say about evolution, for those of us who are scientists and share that belief, that understanding, actually. But, but we have nothing to say about God. But as you know, there are some scientists who have declared that science has disproven God. It's not true. Um, but if you want common ground in the rational middle, right, and we're excluding the sort of militant agnostic. The militant agnostic is the person who says, I don't know if there's a God and neither do you. Um, if you want common ground, we have to engage with the public in a far more uh, sophisticated way. We can't just educate our way out of it. As I said before, it's not that they don't get it. They get it. They don't like it. They're not stuck with it. 
And what we are advocating, this is a movement that's been ongoing in Europe for a long time and has been gaining uh, acceptance more and more in the United States, is to shift the strategy from communicating at the public to communicating with the public, to actually engage. And for scientists, it's not easy. They have to listen to the public, as I'll say in just a minute. We have to listen to the public about their concerns, their priorities, and the kinds of questions that they'd like us to answer. And that will be a base for finding the common ground we need to reduce the tension I referred to. So it's not actually easy because scientists are not well prepared, generally, to speak to the public about their work. Um, partly because it's a learned skill and partly because scientists have a tendency to think only they're smart enough to get it. Um, and I have to say that the act of listening is a learned skill. It's not, it's not actually an innate skill, particularly for scientists. We at AAAS have a whole program called Communicating Science. We take uh, some of our staff who go out to universities around the country and do trainings. We've, had, we've trained maybe 3,000 scientists in the last five years. And it's, what's interesting is 70% of them are young scientists who really would like to do this. More, many more senior scientists are not well interested. The academy complex, we're sitting in a part of it, um, has had one uh, symposium on the science of science communication. We're about to have another one this coming summer through the academies. And we've learned a lot about it. I like that one, too. <laughs> Should we do that? Yeah. OK. Let me just, just go through a little bit why I claim that this is so hard to do and why it's a learned skill. The biggest problem is that scientists and the public think differently. And they sort of um, talk differently. They, they communicate differently. So scientists, if you've noticed, have a tendency to like to build the case, right? So first they give you all of the background and then they work their way up. And then if you're well behaved, you get the point at the end. But if you read newspapers or science magazine, by the way, you will notice that the public wants the bottom line, right? What journalists call the lead. Give them the bottom line, then tell them why they care about it, and then they might read on and get the background and the story. And it's very hard for scientists. Read scientific articles, you'll see. It also is difficult for scientists to realize that what, what the public needs most is to understand the enterprise of science. So I'm something called a behavioral neuroendocrinologist when I was at the bench. And the secret truth is that most people in the public don't need to know the details of pituitary adrenocortical function. It's just not a core part of their modern lives. But they do need to know what science is and isn't, what technology is, what research is about, what, what good science is from fake science or junk science, and they need to understand the limits of science. Uh, this one always kills scientists. Uh, the gist of the message is all that matters. You don't get clauses or caveats. I learned this the, the uh, hard way. So I am one of the people who brought you that uh, mental illnesses are brain diseases. And, and we pr I'm sort of Johnny One Note on brain diseases. But we, we, uh, I actually had the privilege of being in the room with four people when we decided that it was time to tell the world that schizophrenia is a brain disease. Your mother didn't do it to you. Um, and, but when I was working in drug abuse, the truth is, the scientifically accurate statement is addiction is a brain disease, comma, expressed in behavioral ways and in a social context. Nobody ever heard anything but 
you know, Leshner said addiction's a brain disease. And I did, but the, the scientifically accurate statement is with the clauses and caveats. The public doesn't hear it. The way an issue is framed can make all the difference. So climate change is, more, this is a study showed that if it's seen as a technological challenge, not as a regulatory issue, people believe it more. Uh, this one scientists always hate, um, that we need to remain the fact people and leave our values at home. So this is very tough for scientists because unfortunately they're human. And so everybody has personal values. I have personal values. But if you go in as the scientist to say a policymaker, and you say, these are the facts you should use in policy. Well, policy is made on the basis of facts and values. So we're the fact people, right? We're not the value people. Once we're value people, we're just people. We're, we're not, you got it. You don't need me to harangue about that. Um, but it's very hard for scientists. I like this one. I never know where to put that, but I love this point. I, got it from somebody at the Academy thing on science communication. Credibility is conferred by the audience, not the speaker. Don't harangue the public. A uh, little hard for scientists. And this is the only word you will take out of the room. Uh, so I learned this from the then director of the Mexico City Science Museum, and I confess that I thought it was an accent in English when she first said it. But the word is, is a wonderful one. People really only care about issues that affect them personally or locally. And therefore, this word global means to take a global issue and make it meaningful in a personal or local way. And that's a principle. Understanding has to work both ways. So, both the National Academies and we at AAAS are working hard at this, this both public education and public engagement. And the goal, and what I hope you will help us participate in as well, is to bring science and the rest of the public going in the same direction. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>